Hello everybody, today we're going to be breaking down the second part of Divine Comedy, also known as Dante's Purgatorio, as well as breaking down the seven levels of purgatory within the story. If you've seen what is technically the first part of this series, my video about Dante's Inferno, then this picks up immediately where that left off. But if you haven't seen it, then this video will still work, as it's an explanation of Dante and Virgil's journey through purgatory, as well as explaining what purgatory is within the Catholic canon at the time of Dante's writing, as well as a look at the souls that Dante says are there, and the symbolism of the story itself, and what happens to the sinners on each level of purgatory, etc. I'll be honest, I think I like Purgatorio more than I like Inferno. Everyone talks about Inferno because it has the horror elements, and it's scary and has cool illustrations of people being tortured, but as far as a story and what happens to the characters in the story and the symbolism and all that, I think Purgatorio is a better work. I mean, technically they're both sections of the same book, so, you know, it's all one work, but that's not important. You know what is important? Huh? 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 Look at that. Huh? That's pretty neat. It's way bigger than the silver one, uh, and I'm kind of afraid it's going to fall and take out everything beneath it, including two little me's. Uh, but that's okay if it does, because you all put that up there, and you're the reason that that's there, and you're the reason this channel's here, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you, and thank you for that. So if you're interested, stick around as we're going to break down the story of penance and redemption in Dante's Purgatorio. But before we get into that, if you like this video, then you probably like the concept of someone sitting here and explaining something to you in a very interested and exciting manner, hopefully. But personally, I have trouble watching YouTube sometimes, even as someone who makes YouTube videos, because I always feel I'm not being productive enough. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can combine those two aspects and make your free time productive and entertaining thanks to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of members and classes spread across over 150 countries. It's an excellent place to get inspired, learn new skills, and then put them to good use. For example, I've been having trouble with working my camera. So I hopped onto Skillshare, typed in the name of my camera, and found an entire class by Ben Rollins breaking down how to use it and how to adjust the settings for what I needed to do. And thanks to Ben and Skillshare, I was able to get this quality out of my camera that you're seeing right now, which, not to brag, but I think looks pretty nice. So from there, I decided to type in horror to see what comes up, and I found dozens of classes about how to write compelling horror stories and design interesting, scary characters. And if you're interested in starting and growing your YouTube channel, there are literally thousands of videos on the topic and more being made every day. And Skillshare has learning opportunities for everything, from art, to growing your social media presence, to improving your business, to advertising, and anything else you could want to do with your time. Skillshare is also entirely ad-free, so as you're learning all of this information and becoming engaged with the people telling it, you don't have to worry about being taken out of the zone. And new premium classes are being launched each week, and they now have subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. So right now, you can get in on Skillshare and begin learning about whatever it is you want, either for your business, personal life, or something in between. And today, you can start learning for free because the first 1,000 people that go to Skillshare at the link in the description will get one month free. That's right, the first 1,000 people to click the link, get one month free, and can begin learning about all their favorite classes, meeting new creators, and getting better at whatever it is you want to do. For me, it was the camera and quality you're seeing now, and for you, it can be the same or whatever else you like. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. It really does mean the most. I hope you all check them out. I learned a lot, and hopefully you can too at the link in the description, and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. As a super brief rundown of Inferno, if you didn't see that video or are familiar with the work, in it, Dante and a guide by the name of Virgil, who is an ancient Roman poet, walk through the nine layers of hell in order to get out and continue their path towards heaven. Inferno ended with Dante and Virgil making their way out the bottom of the earth and onto a mountain on the southern hemisphere called Mount Purgatory. 
And that is exactly where this story begins, so let's get into it. Now in this story, since Mount Purgatory is on the other side of the Earth, the stars move a bit differently than they do for everyone else. Basically, from their position, they can see the stars at all points during the day. And during the day, Dante makes note that there are four stars appearing in the daylight sky. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of the symbolism because, believe me, there is a ton and I'm sure I missed some of it, but I am going to talk about the things that I noticed. Or, also, things that people on the internet who are smarter than me noticed as well. During the time of Dante's writing, there was an important idea within the Catholic Church known as the Seven Virtues. Now, these virtues have changed and morphed over time to be completely different for what they were at the time of Dante's writing, but at the time, it was believed that four of the virtues, known as the Cardinal Virtues, were achievable by anyone, regardless if they were a believer or not. While there were three spiritual virtues that could only be achieved if someone was a follower of God. The four cardinal virtues were those of justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. While the three spiritual virtues were faith, hope, and love, or instead of love, charity in some cases. As we're going to see, Mount Purgatory is for sinners who committed an action on earth and are now trying to receive forgiveness for it in the afterlife. So the significance of four stars in the daylight hours is to symbolize that this is change that they themselves as people can obtain without having to look to a higher power because that comes later. As Dante is looking at the stars and pondering this, a man comes up to Dante and Virgil and asks what they're doing there. Virgil tells Dante to kneel in reverence as the man identifies himself as Cato. Virgil says to Cato that they were sent by Beatrice, who was sent from God, to continue along this path, and as in every case before, Cato lets them pass. However, before they begin their ascent up the mountain, Virgil takes Dante to a riverside where he literally washes hell from his face. And also, yada yada, baptism, symbolism, moving on. As Dante is standing up, a very bright ship is seen coming onto the shore with an angel standing at the front of it with its wings pointed up towards heaven. This ship is transporting souls to the afterlife, and from the ship, Virgil and Dante can hear people singing hymns and choruses. Think about the stark contrast between this, an angel leading a bright glowing ship and everyone singing, versus the river Styx that was seen in Inferno where everyone's crying and freaking out and the guy's yelling at them and hitting people with a paddle. One figure, a man by the name of Casella, recognizes Dante as they were friends from back home in Florence and the two of them begin singing songs together before Cato tells them not to squander their time and to get moving up the mountain. It's here that I have to start, and I hate to say this, reeling back on some of the criticisms that I said in Inferno. And to be completely honest, I didn't really mean a lot of those criticisms. Like, I really loved the story and thought it was cool, and I was saying a lot of stuff to be funny. And don't worry, I'm going to keep doing that. But in Purgatorio specifically, there were so many moments that I just kind of had to sit there and be like... Alright, that's pretty cool. One of which being in this scene, when Virgil and Dante are beginning their first trek up the mountain. Something I didn't really point out as much as I should have in Inferno, is how dark everything was. And I mean like quite literally, it was hard for them to see all of the time. As a matter of fact, one of the only reasons that Dante is able to see anything throughout the story, is because they come across so many instances of things being on fire. So now that he's standing out in the daylight for the first time since the forest at the beginning of Inferno, he looks down and notices that Virgil doesn't have a shadow. As a matter of fact, no one has a shadow besides him. Virgil explains to Dante that this is because things like light and shadows are aspects of the physical body, whereas the spiritual body or the soul is not limited to the affairs of man. And while yes, the soul does have the physical appearance of the body, that's only because whenever the two are joined together at the beginning, they take on characteristics of each other. The soul taking on the physical appearance of the body, and the body taking on the spiritual attributes of the soul. And throughout the rest of the story, the way that souls identify Dante as not being dead yet is because he has a shadow. That's like an insanely creative concept by today's standards, much less the 1300s when this was written. 
During the course of this discussion, Dante is confused and says he's having trouble grasping what that means, to which Virgil remarks that that tends to be the nature of man. They simply ask questions over and over and can never truly know what it is they should just accept. Even making the note that the philosophers who were mentioned in Limbo at the beginning of Inferno are forever trapped to never know the true nature of the punishment that befalls them. Which that in itself is such a crazy concept. The idea that these people chase the exact answers for what things mean instead of working towards a more better version of themselves and for it they're forever forced to be stuck in this limbo where they won't know what it means. Alright, I'm being too nice to the story. I need to hurry up so we can find something to make fun of. Maybe he'll mention Florence. That's always funny. As they begin to work their way up the mountain, they come across several people who are laying around the rocks at the base of the mountain. And after speaking to them, Dante realizes that these are all people who have been excommunicated from the church. Specifically, one man by the name of Manfred says that however long you were excommunicated, you are forced to be on this layer of purgatory for 30 times that length of time. So if you were kicked out of the church for the last two years of your life, well that's 60 years on the rocks of Mount Purgatory. Now while there are seven layers of purgatory, and they are a clearly defined seven layers, there's kind of nine because this beginning part is like two starter or sub layers. So with that being the case, this first sub layer is kind of that for stubbornness. In other words, people who were slow or lackadaisical with their means of salvation. For example, one person they meet there by the name of Belequa believed and repented for his sins on his deathbed. And according to him, he has to spend the length of his life on earth here on the shores of purgatory, which seems to be inhabited by people who were stubborn, or in other words, died without giving a final repentance or confession. For example, one of the people on this layer say that they died a very bloody battle in war, but before the battle did not think to confess their sins. The souls of this layer realize that Dante has a shadow, and they immediately begin pleading with him that if he goes back to Earth, to ask people to pray for them. He then meets a man by the name of Sordello, who was a 13th century poet in Italy, who begins to talk about Italian politics and how Florence is going to crumble at the hands of their current leaders, and I told you he'd go back to talking about Florence. Alright, so at this point, it would probably help to make sure we're all on the same page if I explained what the purpose of purgatory is. And I want to emphasize, yes, I know purgatory is a thing in most Catholic beliefs. However, this was written in the 1300s, so don't apply things I'm saying then to mean how it really is, especially with Dante's interpretation of it being like a literal mountain. During Inferno, the people who were mentioned to be in hell were people who had done horrific acts in their life to others or people who didn't believe in God. Purgatory is for people who did believe in God and just had sin in their life that they need to overcome, and the sins of Purgatory are more based on ideas of character flaws rather than open violence and harm for others. Because of that, the layers of Mount Purgatory are based on the seven deadly sins. Because each of those sins are about things people feel within themselves that cause them to do wrong. Which leads to the core difference between Purgatory and Hell. In Hell, there is no escape and you are doomed to suffer there forever, whereas in Purgatory, there is a way out. At the entrance of Hell, it said, Abandon all hope ye who enter here. Because once you're punished there, the purpose of your punishment is just that, suffering. Whereas in Purgatory, the punishments that we're going to see are temporary, because if someone can get through it and their soul be cleansed, they are then deemed worthy of traveling into Heaven. We'll get more into the weeds of it as we get to the different levels of Purgatory, but whenever you hear about different people either having some form of contentment or talking about how they need to get through this suffering, it's because once they're done with that, they're then allowed to cross into heaven. With the people in these two pre-levels that I talked about earlier having to endure a waiting time before they can even be judged. 
And even though the story doesn't specifically go into detail about what happens to the people on these two pre-levels, from my understanding, once that one character spends his entire lifetime on Earth in Purgatory, he can then either go into Heaven if he had a pure soul, or begin his penance on one of the seven tiers. Regardless, Dante and Virgil continue on their path and are nearly to the entrance of the first layer of Purgatory. However, as they're almost there, night begins to set in, and Virgil says it's a rule that no one is allowed to climb the mountain without the presence of the sun. Now this is obviously symbolic of the Son of God, because as in the story, no one is allowed to climb the mountain without it being daylight, no one is able to climb the mountain at all if it wasn't for Jesus dying on the cross. Also, cool side note, because they're on the southern hemisphere and they thought the earth was tilted differently than it is, the sun always stays in the north and simply goes up and then goes back down. As the night comes, Dante also realizes that the four stars in the sky have disappeared and now there are three stars. If you'll remember earlier, this is a mention of the three spiritual virtues. During the day, the sinners work to achieve what they can with their own merit, which is the cardinal virtues, and now that it's nighttime, the spiritual virtues watch over them. During the night, all of the souls begin singing songs and hymns. Dante noticed that the only two people he can see that are not is that of King Henry and Emperor Rudolph. Both, as Virgil says, two people who were too focused on earthly matters and therefore lost out on spiritual goods. And this is the next point where I have to just take a moment to say this is really cool. Every night in Purgatory, the snake from the Garden of Eden comes out and tries to tempt more sinners to turn their backs on God. However, here in Purgatory, every night, two angels descend from heaven to fight off the serpent. Dante notices that the swords of these angels are broken at the tip and seem very blunt. Virgil says this is because the battle has been going on for thousands of years, and whenever the swords are finally destroyed, it will be time for Judgment Day to come. That's just, like, such a really cool detail. To say that the serpent is to this day trying to trick sinners to fall away from the path of God, but now angels are fighting him, and when the swords break, it's the end times, and that's just like, that's just neat, moving on. Like, I'll be honest, some of the stuff in this story made me feel bad for being harsh in the first one, and like, even then it was a joke. I loved Inferno, and I was just having fun, but especially near the end of this story, I felt guilty. <laughs> so Dante decides to go to sleep, and during his sleep, he has his first of three dreams throughout this story. In the first dream, he sees a golden eagle pick him up and begin to soar him high above the clouds. However, once it gets too close to the sun, he begins to burn up before he wakes up. Keep that in mind. I'll talk about dream symbolism at the end, but just hold on to that for now. When Dante wakes up, he is lying in front of a large gate, to which Virgil says he was carried by Saint Lucy. In front of the gate of Purgatory, there stands an angel holding a sword, and in front of that angel are three steps. The steps are in order from Dante to the door, a marble stair, a stone stair, and a red gemstone stair. And my personal interpretation, or at least the interpretation I agree with, is that it's that of salvation. The marble stair being man's original condition as a beautiful untouched thing, the stone stair being what happens to man whenever sin comes into it and makes it into an ugly stone, and the red gemstone being the idea of the blood covering it and making it into something beautiful again. The angel asks the men what they are doing there, and especially Dante, considering that he's not even dead yet, to which Virgil says they have been sent by Beatrice on a path from God, and the angel carves seven of the letter P's into Dante's forehead. This P stands for peccatum, which is an old Latin word essentially meaning sin. In order to get to the top of Mount Purgatory, Dante will have to pass through every one of the seven layers. At the end of each layer, one of these P's or peccatums will be removed from Dante's forehead. With that, Dante and Virgil cross through the gates where they can hear hymns being sang, and they make their way into the first level of purgatory, Pride. 
Now, if you'll remember, the entire purpose of purgatory is so that sinners can remove whatever sin besets them so that they can be worthy of entering heaven. So because of that, wherever we see one of the seven deadly sins, there is the counter to that sin placed everywhere on that level, either through physical images or visions that the characters have, or just people quoting lines from the Bible. So on the first level for pride, the trait being praised is humility. So upon entering the path through the level of pride, which is a sort of zigzag narrow straight that works its way up the mountain, there are several depictions of humility, such as Mary being told by Gabriel that she will be having the Son of God, as well as David who was told that he is going to become king. As they're walking along the path, Dante sees several people who it seems are bowed down to the ground and staring at the floor. Upon getting closer, Dante realizes that the reason for this is because everyone on this level is forced to carry massive stones that are equal to the pride they carried in life. And while passing by, Dante can hear the people carrying these stones reciting the Lord's Prayer for those still on earth. This is already a very dramatic shift from the souls of hell. In hell, people were either cursing their livelihood or simply afraid of the torment they're experiencing, while here in purgatory, people are trying to better themselves or at the very least sorry for the lives that they had. Some of the most interesting characters that they meet on this level is that of King Saul and Arachne. Arachne being the character from Greek mythology, and this is again another example of Dante mixing Greek mythology with biblical teachings. And on the flip side of the carvings that were mentioned before of those who showed humility, we also have several carvings of cases of pride. One of these massive marble carvings being that of Satan being kicked out of heaven, which you could argue as the original sin or at least original sin of pride, as well as Nimrod, the giant who built the Tower of Babel, and depictions of the Battle of Troy. Again, biblical theology mixed with Greek mythology. Furthermore, as Dante and Virgil reach the end of this first tier, the souls that are near the end are more penitent or more experienced with their circumstance, and they can hear them singing in unison, Blessed are the poor in spirit, which is one of the Beatitudes from Matthew. It seems that the souls near the exit are closer to achieving their purification, or at the very least, their hearts more in the right place. Dante remarks that as soon as the pea was removed from his forehead, he felt a little bit lighter, and the path of the mountain seemed a lot easier. Virgil says that Dante's entire life, he has been weighed down with the sins of the world, and he didn't even know it. And whenever Dante was talking to the people who were carrying the stones, Dante himself had to bend over and mimic their posture, and in his own way, even if as not as extreme, he is doing penance for those same sins. So now that he has done his penance for pride and had the pee removed from his forehead, he literally feels better because there is less sin burdening his spirit. Which is another pretty cool note from the story. The idea that he had always been experiencing this burden, but now that he was literally mimicking the posture of those who are suffering because of their pride, he lost his pride and therefore is getting closer to becoming a clean spirit that is capable of entering heaven. And continuing on this path, Dante and Virgil reach the second level of purgatory, envy. Dante remarks that the path they're walking on gets more narrow the further they go up the mountain, and this continues throughout the rest of the story. The idea being that the closer you are to perfection, the less are able to walk the path. In this level of envy, they begin hearing voices that are expressing the opposite of envy, generosity. Among the voices, they hear someone speak of Orestes, a character who was generous in Greek mythology, as well as quotes of the Virgin Mary from the book of John. Mary has been mentioned before, and she's going to be mentioned a lot more, because in Catholic tradition, especially at the time, she was considered the most virtuous human who ever lived other than Jesus. And Jesus was also the Son of God, so that's kind of cheating, so many consider Mary to be the most perfect person. And because of that, she embodies generosity as well as several of the other virtues that we're going to talk about. Dante sees several people who seem as if they're leaning on each other. After getting closer, Dante realizes that the reason for this is because they're all blind as their eyes are wired shut. 
The idea being because these people were envious of possessions that they saw others having in life, they are now forced to walk blind without the eyes that troubled them. Dante speaks to one woman from Italy by the name of Sapia, who said that she is there because she used to get more joy out of others' misfortune than her own fortune. To which Dante promises to pray for her as well as tell people back home to pray for her as well. See, in Inferno, the core concept behind the piousness that Dante had is that, for one, these people are sinners and are getting what they deserve, but also because there is no hope for them, so why cry over spilt milk? Whereas the souls here in Purgatory do have a chance and opportunity to get better because of the mercy of Christ, so therefore Dante agrees to pray for them, and it's shown in the story to be a good thing to pray for the dead, because this is the point where piousness is put away and pity is accepted. And also, if any of this sounds brutal, like the people on the pride tier have to carry big rocks and the people on envy are blind, I want you to remember that there were multiple occasions in hell of people literally boiling forever. And that's the ones who were lucky enough to be allowed to move around. There were like, remember the Pope tube? where they were in like these stone coffins and on fire forever? Or the 10th tier, which is just being conscious and freezing to death forever. There is a scene on this tier where two blind men approach Dante and there is a very long section talking about Italian politics. And I do want to make a slight pardon on my first part. I made fun a lot about how Dante kept asking about Florence and what's going on in Florence, which again, don't worry, I'll still do that. But there is an honor to it because you have to remember in real life, this book was written as a political hit piece because he was banned from his homeland. And in that book, when he's trying to emphasize how much he misses his city and how much he loves it, there is a beauty to him walking through hell and only caring to ask people of what's happening back home. All right, now that that serious moment's out of the way, I'm going to go back to making fun of it. So, haha, ha, Dante talks about Italy for a little while, and then they keep walking. As with the previous tier, to contrast the examples of generosity mentioned earlier, they begin hearing voices that speak of cases of envy. Such as people speaking of Cain's envy, the original envy that led to the first murder. And another beatitude is heard being sung as they leave the tier, that being, blessed be the merciful. Virgil has a moment here where he explains to Dante the reason envy is an issue and the reason that it's so prominent on earth is because humans view everything in earthly matters. So if a human gives something to someone else, they view that form of charity as a loss or as losing something. When in actuality, all physical things on earth can be lost, but spiritual goodness cannot. So in reality, if they give away an item to achieve essentially spiritual points, that is the real gain. And the reason people are so poor and envious on earth is because they can't think of things in spiritual manners. Again, really cool ideas of faith and charity mentioned in the same breath as people with copper wire closing up their eyes. And as they make their way out of this layer, the angel of generosity appears and wipes another pea from Dante's forehead. The two then make their way into the third level of purgatory, wrath. And as with the previous tiers, as they enter, they are shown examples of the opposite of wrath, that being meekness. The examples being Mary finding young Jesus in the temple speaking to the Pharisees, as well as Stephen stoning. Both examples of times people could have reacted with wrath, but instead chose to react with humility and meekness. Throughout this layer, there is a deep and dark smoke everywhere that makes it near impossible to see anything. And throughout the smoke, Dante can hear people singing of the Lamb of God. Again, people trying to serve their sentence in order to become a better person. Dante and Virgil come across a man on this layer by the name of Marco, who explains that just as in life, rage and wrath blinded them, to the true workings of the world, here in the afterlife they are forced to suffer by being blinded perpetually. Not blinded like the envy people blinded, blinded like big smoke cloud blinded. There's a very interesting conversation here where Dante asks if the problem with humanity is in the stars itself, or in other words, are people who do bad things just part of a system that makes them do bad things? 
To which Marco replies that if that were the case, then free will would not exist, and the very nature of free will is the capability to do right and wrong. This conversation then shifts into how leaders have led entire countries and civilizations to the path of wrong throughout history. And there's this part I really like where Marco's talking about kingships and how entire countries have been led wrong, where he says, quote, the sword and the shepherd's crook are now joined. Talking about the sword of man, which is things like power and conquest, are joined to the shepherd's crook, which is religion and spiritualism, and he's talking about the church and how they've mixed the two and it's not working. See, this is what I wanted out of Inferno, and one of the reasons that I like Purgatorio more than Inferno. There were so many instances in Inferno where Dante would walk up to someone and they'd say where they're from, and he'd be like, huh, isn't that an awful city to live? You know why? Because their politicians aren't good people. Whereas here, he goes up to people and he asks some question about free will, to which the person will say something like, well, the issue with empires is that the sword is joined to the shepherd's crook. And that's such a more cool and effective way to say it, and I like it a lot more. And I can't really say Dante's writing improved for one it's been about a thousand years and i don't think it matters but also because this was all part of the same book so maybe this was always in the back of his head and he was leading to it maybe i'm an idiot who doesn't understand writing and i'm being dumb and as a youtuber am judging the divine comedy as a literary work so i'm just gonna move on and as with the previous layers as they're leaving dante begins having visions of instances of wrath one being Lavinia from one of Virgil's stories, as well as the hanging of Haman from the story of Esther, with another beatitude being Sang, this one being Blessed Be the Peacemakers. See, what happened with all of the previous three tiers is that upon entering, they see the thing that the sinners are supposed to do, they then see the sinner's punishment, leave with the notion of what the sinners did, or examples of wrath and pride and envy, and then hear the sinners chanting about wanting to be better. It's at this point that the sun is beginning to set again, and as mentioned earlier, no one is allowed to climb at night. So as they set down, Virgil begins to explain to Dante, similar to how he did at Inferno, how these tears are separated and what it all means in what is potentially my favorite conversation of the whole story. As Dante sets down to sleep for the night, Virgil explains to him that there are two kinds of love, there is the natural love, which every human has, which is the drawing towards God and things that are true good, and then there is the love of the mind. This love of mind is different from every person to person, and is their perception of what love means. In other words, whatever vice or thing they want to chase with their time is what their mind convinces them that they do love, and this can lead to good or bad. Therefore, Every good or bad action that people commit comes from a place of love. For example, if your mind convinces you that you love yourself and you act on it, that's pride. If your mind convinces you that you love what someone else has, that's envy and so on and so forth. He explains that purgatory is separated into two sections, lower purgatory and upper purgatory. Lower purgatory is the three tiers that they just passed. All of these are examples of misplaced love. In other words, pride, envy, and wrath are all examples of placing your love and affection on either yourself or things. Meaning that this perverted love is actually considered worse than the other kind. And the other kind are the four sins that inhabit upper purgatory. These four sins are broken love, or in other words, love that was heading the right direction but by some means or the other stray too far. So rather than completely just saying, well, I'm going to love myself and hurt others to do that, these, as we're going to see, are heading the right way, but either doing bad things in the process or taking that love too far. Virgil describes all of this by saying that whenever the mind has a thing that it wants, it bends the thoughts of the human towards that thing, and that's what love is. Once love has existed for a long enough time on one specific thing, that is where desire comes from. And when something of desire is achieved or taken, that is where joy comes from. 
Virgil explains this as being the reason that not all forms of desire and joy are good, because the mind could theoretically bend itself towards whatever the user wished. Dante then asks the question, well, if humans have desire for something in particular, then are they just doomed to chase that forever? Because what if someone has a desire for something that's wrong? Is that wrong for them to deny themselves joy? Virgil says that this in itself is the essence of righteousness and character, because free will, the unique characteristic of humanity, is not only to turn away from God and follow their own paths, but also to turn away from one's own desire. Therefore, free will also means free will from your own mind, and in order to chase what is right and what is pure instead of what is not, is what righteousness is. And if it wasn't for those impure desires, then there would be no merit for by which humans could be judged. This is like... the. Uh, th there's this really dumb thing in like modern science and academia and whatever where they're like man all those guys who came before us they were just stupid weren't they and and i know i realized in the first part of the series i slightly contributed to that and i apologize but there's this weird thing where they're like oh i guess those guys didn't know better or man it's cool that we have all this information from books and textbooks that we know what we're talking about what i just said reading it is one of the craziest, most interesting concepts in all of Christian theology. And it came from a guy in the 1300s who was talking about climbing a mountain because his ghost girlfriend told him to. The idea that righteousness and character itself comes from the constant balance of free will and how well people can balance that free will is amazing and I love it and I love this stuff. So it's here after leaving lower purgatory that they begin on their first layer of upper purgatory with layer four, sloth. They technically got just into the layer of sloth before this conversation started. I just really wanted to talk about that conversation. And after this, Dante goes to sleep in which he has his second dream. The short version of this dream is that he sees a beautiful woman approach him and begin to try to entice him to come closer. But while that woman is speaking, another beautiful woman appears and tells the first woman to stop, to which Dante realizes that it's actually a very ugly and scary looking woman, to which Virgil then runs up and guts the ugly woman, because Dante realizes this is actually a siren trying to trick him, and then he wakes up. Again, symbolism after the third one, moving on. The actual images and signs of penance in these final four layers isn't as intense as the first three, because as mentioned, the first three were all about people who entirely misplaced what love was and that led them to wrong paths, whereas these are people who kind of had their heart in the right place they just either went too far or not far enough. Sloth being the prime example for that, with the counter of it being zeal. And on this layer, the souls who inhabit it are forced to run all the time non-stop. Symbolically, because they were so lazy and slow in life, here they are forced to be the complete opposite. And they are shouting examples of zealous people in history, such as Mary, who ran to tell Elizabeth that she was pregnant with Jesus. That's really it <laughs> for this it's not mentioned that much uh that huge conversation that i did happened on this tier but it didn't have to do with this tier and they just see a bunch of people running and talking about being zealous and dante and virgil just keep walking so we're gonna keep walking also i keep being bad to mention this because it's just a point in my notes and i roll over it at the end of every one of these tiers the angel of that virtue appears and wipes a pee off of Dante's forehead. So in this one, it's the angel of zeal, wipes the pee off, he keeps going. It's here that they come to the fifth layer, greed. It's technically avarice. Avarice is doing things to achieve and maintain wealth, whereas greed is just more broadly wanting wealth. So greed can lead to avarice, but not vice versa. However, I'm going to leave it as greed because that fits the seven deadly sins thing. Across this layer, the souls are laid across the ground and quoting Psalm 119, which literally says, my soul cleaves to the dust. 
The hands and feet of these people are bound so that they can't get up, and they're essentially forced to lie there on their stomach until their penance is over. One of the people that Dante meets there is Pope Adrian, who in real life was known for amassing wealth, and whenever Dante tries to bow himself before him in reverence, Adrian tells him to stop because here they are both equal servants of the same god, which is a cool touch. They continue walking and hearing someone weeping about Mary after the birth of Christ specifically her living situation and her content nature of her poverty. Poverty, or more specifically being content with poverty, being the opposite virtue of avarice, or pretty much charity, as we would say. Kinda. I mean, the virtue that's mentioned here is poverty, but as we understand it in the modern age, that's not like a virtue, just being poor, but you get the point. The man that is weeping about Mary is someone by the name of Hugh Capet. Capiche being the founder of the Capetian dynasty in France, which is a series of kings that were alive during Dante's age, and more specifically a dynasty that Florence had just made an allegiance with. So Hugh in this scene talks about how the rulers of France are plotting to betray those in Florence. Again, if you're gonna make a political hit piece set in hell, do not just talk about why Florence is being stupid. Have someone who has a historical relation to Florence talk about how Florence is being stupid. They then continue walking up the mountain when the mountain begins violently shaking, to which angels appear and begin seeing Gloria in excelsis Deu, which is what the angels sang whenever Christ's birth was announced. It's at this point a man by the name of Stadius runs up to them and introduces himself. Stadius was a Roman poet who was alive in the first century AD. Stadius explains that the mountain violently shakes every time a sinner has gone through with their penance. In other words, that means someone else is now ready to enter heaven, and this time it was Stadius himself. Stadius said that he had been on this layer of greed for 500 years. And he later mentions that he was also doing time in one of the earlier stages for 500 years. Which means that you can have multiple sentences on multiple layers of this purgatory. Because I want to remind you that earlier, the characters of Arachne and Saul, who were seen way down on the Pride one, Saul had to be in there for like over 4,000 years. Is that math right? At least like three. And theoretically, that's like just the end for his pride one. Then he's gonna have to go to like the wrath and everything else. Which, I mean, to be fair, is better than like the hell for everything, but still. So Stadius is very excited because he essentially got his ticket punch to walk up the golden staircase, and he is very excited to tell Dante and Virgil everything about himself. And then there is a fantastic moment where Stadia says that he is obsessed with the ancient poet Virgil because he doesn't know that it's Virgil he's talking to, and even says that his work The Aenid inspired everything that Stadius had ever done, and he wishes so badly he could have lived at the time of Virgil so that he could meet the great poet Virgil. To which Dante says, Laughter and tears follow so closely on the passion prompts them. They wait not for the motions of the will in nature's most sincere. I did but smile as one who winks, and thereupon the shade broke off and peered into mine eyes, where best our looks interpret. In other words, Dante started smiling and crying because he was trying to hold it in, and just turned to look at Virgil. To which Stadia says, So to good event, mayest thou conduct such great emprise, he cried. Say, why across thy visage beamed, but now, the lightning of a smile? So now, Dante is crying and trying to hold in a laugh, looking at Virgil, and this Stadius guy, who just got done with a thousand years of purgatory, is like, hey, come on, buddy, why are you smiling right now? To which it says about the stoic Virgil, Whence a sigh I utter, and the sigh is heard, Speak on, the teacher cried, and do not fear to speak, but tell him what so earnestly he asks. To which Dante immediately tells Stadius that this is Virgil, and Stadius drops to the ground and tries to hug his legs, and Virgil has to tell him to stop. It's so fantastic to be reading about penitent sinners, 
and concepts of free will and then get that moment where Dante's giggling like a schoolgirl because he knows he's about to embarrass Virgil and it literally says that Virgil sighs and is like go ahead tell him I'm the guy and then he tries to hug his legs and Virgil's like stop don't touch me and since Dante and Virgil were walking up Mount Purgatory to heaven Stadia simply joins them and from here on out the three men begin their trek up to the next layer to which they reach the sixth layer of purgatory, gluttony. Now remember with tiers four, five, six, and seven, it has to do with not having the right temperance when it comes to good love. In other words, slot meant not doing the good thing enough. Greed meant wanting to be too successful or do too well that you hurt others. And gluttony being, you know, things like food, which are important, indulging in them too much. Also, gluttony, as it's written here and in most traditions, includes things like alcoholism and being a drunkard. These concepts of the sins are elaborated more when Virgil asks Stadius how such a great poet of renown could be guilty for something like greed. Stadius says that what he was actually there for is wild expense, or in other words, being too frivolous and wasting all of his money, which lands you on the same tier as greed because even though they're opposites, it both has to do with like love of material possessions and wealth. It's here that he said he was a Christian but he was afraid to make it public and he hid his faith which is what got him another sentence on the layer of sloth. Going back to the whole you can do multiple sentences on multiple tiers for multiple sins. There's another interesting dialogue piece where Stadius talks about all of the poets that he grew up learning of and those who inspired him and Virgil says that he knows most of them personally because they're all in limbo together. They then come into the main part of the gluttony layer and see what the punishment is. There are these sweet smelling trees that are all over the layer of gluttony and from the trees voices can be heard. These voices speak of the opposite of gluttony, that being temperance, and it's examples like Daniel and John the Baptist in the Bible, both characters who fasted. These trees have a very delicious looking fruit on them, and they let out a very sweet aroma that makes everyone who smells it incredibly hungry. Dante even falls victim to this, talking about how he wants to go check out the tree, before Virgil stops him and says that he's better than them. Dante sees a man that he knew from Florence by the name of Forcy, and Forcy explains that every day they try to eat the fruit from the tree and get a little bit closer, but they're never actually allowed to grab it. And they are cursed for the length of their penance to smell the fruit and be hungry for it while never reaching it or in other words, perpetual hunger and desire. They also hear some voices from the tree talking about other examples of gluttons in biblical history, such as Gideon's army who left the army because they were too concerned with filling themselves. Forsey explains that he can't eat or drink anything despite being hungry. However, his penance will not be that long because his wife has prayed for him. It still is a belief and was especially a belief at the time that you can pray for sinners who are in purgatory in order for them to have a more speedy access to heaven. So I guess as Dante saying it here, people who pray for you in the real world quite literally net you a shorter sentence here in purgatory. This would explain why Forcy, who only died a few months ago as Dante said, is near his end of penance, whereas someone like Stadius, who never told anyone he was a Christian, and therefore wouldn't have anyone to pray for him in the real world, was down there for a thousand years. Virgil also says here that the trees everyone are trying to reach are from the fruit of the tree in the Garden of Eden, meaning that these trees hold the fruit for which man committed the original sin, and this is the final penance for those who indulge with food too much in their lives. Stuff like that again. So cool. I love it. Moving on. This concept of food gets Dante thinking about how most of the souls they come across are very skinny and decrepit. Dante asks Stadius if souls don't need to eat, then why are some of them so skinny, but those like Stadius are very strong and buff. Stadius explains that the bodies are now separated from the spirit, so what Dante is viewing is the spiritual power or fulfillment of that soul itself. Those who are still serving their penance are very skinny and decrepit because they don't have any power or value built up in their soul, 
Whereas Stadius, who has completed his penance and is now ready for heaven, looks like a very Adonis buff man because that is his soul fully refreshed. It is on this note that our trio then enters the final layer of purgatory with layer 7, Lust. Remember how I said the path keeps getting more and more narrow as they travel up? Well, at this point, the path is a very skinny trail that they have to shimmy their way across one at a time. As they walk along this rim, there is a fire in all of these pits around them, with souls running back and forward through the flames. However, it's important to denote, while this fire is hot, it is not burning, but is instead purifying. If it sounds like the punishments have been getting less extreme throughout Purgatory, that's because they have. Pride had to carry a giant boulder for potentially hundreds of years, and the people of Envy had their eyes sewn shut. Whereas the last couple be, you have to lay down, and you're hungry. And that's really it. And as we're going to find out in a second, everyone, regardless of what their penance is, has to walk through these flames in order to make it into heaven. These flames being the final purification of the human soul. So yes, while those guilty of lust have to walk through these flames a few more times, they essentially serve no extra punishment than something that every other soul is already receiving. The reason being, according to Dante, lust is the sin that it is most easy to commit. If you'll remember in hell, the lightest here next to limbo, because that was technically like non-hell, was that of lust in which people were just blown around. And then here on the mirror side of it, it is the one closest to the top or final destination of purgatory because again, it is seen as the least severe. As mentioned with sloth, greed, and gluttony, it is placing love in the correct direction. It's just with lust taking an excess of it. This is exemplified when a group of people walk by around the side of the flames and they are kissing each other. However, whenever they begin to take it further than kissing, everyone begins yelling and ridiculing them and talking about examples of lust in Greek literature. And the reason they are in this stage is because they have to purify themselves from that want of excess. During this stage, they can hear the souls singing about the God of Supreme Clemency, as well as speaking quotes from examples of chastity, the opposite of lust, such as the Virgin Mary and the Goddess Diana. Everyone begins singing, Blessed are the pure in heart, the final beatitude that's mentioned, as the trio makes their way to a giant wall of fire and the angel of chastity appears. This is normally the point where the angel would just wipe the letter P off of his forehead. However, this is the last ring and the angel explains to them that they are going to have to cross to the fire if they want to make it to heaven. Dante immediately begins shaking and becomes terrified to which Virgil reaffirms him that Beatrice is just on the other side and they just have to make it a little bit longer and Virgil says no matter what, he won't leave him in these flames. So all three of them step into the flames to which Dante remarks that it's so hot he would step into a glass boiling vat to cool down. As they're walking through the fire, Virgil maintains his composure and says that he can still remember the beauty in Beatrice's eyes, and Dante just needs to go a bit further to see them. They step out of the fire, and Dante has had the final letter P removed from his forehead as he has now been cleansed of his earthly sins. They see a path before them, however, it is night once again, so they decide to sleep for the night. Or at least... Dante sleeps and Stadius and Virgil stand there because as it's mentioned, souls don't need rest. It's here that Dante dreams of Leah and Rachel, Abraham's wives mentioned in the Old Testament. In this dream, Leah is in a field working and she remarks that she enjoys working, but her sister Rachel seems to enjoy being by herself and Leah doesn't know what's the better option. So now that we have the three dreams, here's my very short interpretation, which could be totally wrong, but like I said, it's my interpretation. With the first dream, we had a golden eagle soar down, pick up Dante, and take him into the clouds to which he burned up. The eagle, as it's mentioned here and will be mentioned in the future, is a representative of God, and it shows that God, in his divine power, cannot take man straight to the clouds as they will not be able to handle the power. 
Because of that, Dante is forced to continue his journey, to which he has the second dream of a siren tempting him, to which a woman, which women are used several times to show acts of virtues later on in the story. So we have the symbol of virtue stopping temptation, and his guide, Virgil, literally destroying and killing that temptation. To which finally we see Leah talking about how there are two options to live your life, that of work and that of meditation. So my interpretation, God wants to bring humanity, or Dante specifically, up to his presence, but Dante cannot handle it, so therefore he must travel through life while facing temptations, and thanks to things like virtues and his guides like Virgil, he is able to quite literally destroy them and continue on his path while living a life, as Leah says, in combination with spiritual meditation and earthly practices and praxis of your meditation. In other words, it's the entire tribulation and circumstance of the Christian life or at least as Dante sees it. And it's fitting that he has this final dream of himself and of what he's lived his life like on earth before he gets to the steps of heaven. So they make their way to the top of the stairs and are now standing before the gates of the Garden of Eden. At the top of Mount Purgatory is the birthplace of humanity itself, with the mountain later made around it so that sinners could earn their way back to the paradise that was originally intended for them. The Garden of Eden also serves as the gateway to heaven and is their final stop here on earth. However, as Virgil points out, this is only intended for believers and those who can make their way into heaven itself, which means that Virgil can no longer accompany Dante on his journey. Dante is immediately and afraid of this. He's terrified by the idea that Virgil can't walk with him anymore, but Virgil tells him that he's had all of his sins absconded, and he is now a believer who is not held back by earthly means. Or, in other words, Dante is a better leader now than Virgil ever could be. To which, in his goodbye and his final line in the Divine Comedy, Virgil says, to secure thee, thou mayest or seat thee down, or wonder where thou wilt. Expect no more sanction of warning voice or sign for me, free of thy own arbitrament to choose, discreet, judicious. To distrust thy sense were henceforth error. I invest thee then with crown of mitre, sovereign or thyself. In other words, I've been with you up until this point so that you could be better than me, so that you could have that serenity over yourself. And now I crown you with that blessing as your teacher that you're now ready to carry on by yourself. Why is this story getting to me a little bit? I just realized sitting here that Virgil didn't have to walk through that fire at the end, uh, the final step before they took the rest. Because the purpose of the fire is to purify the soul so that it can enter heaven. Virgil walked through the fire just so Dante wouldn't have to do it alone. And I didn't... Oh boy. <laughs> I wanted to make fun of Florence. And I wanted to talk about... Haha, look at this stupid Pope who's in the tube because he's in hell forever. And that's what I started this doing. And now I'm attached to some Roman poet who accompanied this dumb guy who's talked about dreams three times now. And I realized that this entire time he was preparing Dante to go to a place that Virgil himself could not go. And every step of the, like I knew it from the beginning, but every step of the way Virgil has suffered with Dante so that Dante could be more than Virgil could. Anyway, and with that, Dante says goodbye to Virgil, and Dante and Stadius cross the threshold into the Garden of Eden. It's there that Dante says the air of Eden is filled with a peace and stillness he can't really describe. And while the air is filled with songbirds and the river rushes nearby, everything feels perfectly still. It's there that Dante sees a beautiful woman who is singing by the river. This woman will later be identified as Matilda, to which Matilda says this garden exists as an endless pledge of peace, and that its very existence from the flowers that are in it to the birds that are in it and the water that flows 
are all directly made and continued by the will of God. And that despite humanity leaving it, God dang it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I don't talk about in videos a lot, but there are a few things that um, get to me more than stuff about like mercy and uh, forgiveness and all that. I'm Just give me a minute. I take it back. I don't like purgatorio more. more. It makes me feel gross things like emotions and uh, stuff. Uh, she says that God maintains and takes care of the garden every day in case humanity ever decides that it wants to come back home. She says that not only is this garden the birthplace of humanity, but that its very existence is in the core memory of every person. To the degree that whenever the poets would talk about the perfect age or the golden age that came so many years ago, they were misremembering and it's actually visions of Eden. According to her, man's intent was always this, a perfect area where nothing goes wrong and people can live eternally. But once free will allowed sin to corrupt the hearts of men, everything that I've explained from hell to purgatory and so on is people trying to take off the burden or the layers of sin that is wrapped around them so that they can be allowed more perfect to enter the garden once again. It's then that Matilda tells the two to look through the tree line to which Dante can see what looks to be seven glowing candlesticks getting closer and the description that follows is long and a lot so I'm going to give like an abridged version of it. There is essentially a parade of people in white robes, as well as seven women dancing, dressed by their color in groups of four and three, relating back to the virtues. There are several cherubim, or the four-winged angels with many animal faces, and a chariot that is being pulled by a griffin. Again, we have another intense mixture of a lot of symbolism, but also mythology stuff like the griffin with biblical stuff like the cherubim. And what we're essentially seeing is a giant heavenly parade. There's also 100 angels above the parade singing, but that's kind of standard fare at this point. And out of the chariot steps a lady wearing a green robe, a red dress with a veil over her face. And when Dante sees this, he panics and turns to speak to Virgil, who isn't there anymore to which the woman wearing the veil reveals herself as Beatrice. Finally, the one who began this entire story has met with Dante in person. Dante begins to cry as he misses the comfort and presence of his friend, to which Beatrice says that everyone here is happy. What right does he have to climb up this mountain and begin weeping in front of all of them? And like, I'm going to maintain myself, try to, and not look like a little wimp getting through this, but I am saying, and I've mentioned this before, I am a Christian, and while I don't believe in all of the hoopla about, you know, the angels or characters he runs into and all that, a lot of these ideas are really personal, and really powerful to me, so I'm going to try to be a big boy, but no promises. Whenever Dante looks at Beatrice, he says that he awakens the primal or original love. Now, it's no secret that throughout this story, Beatrice has been used as a stand-in for Christ, or holiness in general. From the beginning, she is said to be the one who called for Dante directly and essentially serve as his savior throughout the story. And whenever he uses that phrase there of primal love, that is used historically to denote the original love or the love that Christ had on the cross. So with Beatrice here being a representation of Christ, Dante immediately breaks down and begins to ask for, dang it, <laughs> and begins to ask for her forgiveness, saying that since she left or died on earth, he has instead followed things in life that didn't really matter. And now standing before her, he can't think of any excuses of why he didn't just keep doing as she asked and pursuing a good life. Beatrice says that after she died, Dante lost his way of life and was becoming distracted on the path. So she herself went to God and begged him to allow Dante to walk through hell and purgatory so that he could come here and have his sins forgiven. 
again, Beatrice symbolically being the stand-in for Christ, making the intercession to God for man, and eventually sending himself so that Dante could return to the garden. That is the catalyst to this entire story. Beatrice wanted Dante to be able to make it to heaven, and she felt that he wasn't living the lifestyle that would have got him there, so she requested and God allowed her to specifically go and have Virgil carry Dante all the way up that mountain. To which Beatrice asked, if I've done all of that for you, then what reason do you have to have followed the sins that you did on earth? To which Dante confesses that he did chase sins and earthly desires in his lifetime, but now standing before the Garden of Eden and in front of an infinite love that dragged him back there, he said his desires don't seem that important anymore. You know, it also kind of recontextualizes Inferno, right? Because throughout Inferno, Dante was coming across these sinners who were suffering and they were in the depths of despair and misery for the sins that they had committed. And Dante would come to them and they would talk about uh, the position of suffering they're in and Dante would just kind of be like, why? Why did you chase that? Why in life did you hurt people or chase after greed or whatever? And they would always say, I don't know, I'm sorry. And now here at the top of the mountain, while maybe not as severe as those people in hell, here in the Garden of Eden, a symbol uh, to the story, a symbol of perfection, asks him, but what of your sins? And he is in the exact same position as those sinners from before, to where he can't answer and he just collapses. Not really like he got his comeuppance or anything, although he did in a way, but more so a call out of a false righteousness. The river that separates them is known as the River Leith, and Matilda mentioned earlier that any sinner who steps into the river will forget all of their sins. So Dante, who has just collapsed from being so overwhelmed by his sins while in a place of perfection, Matilda comes to him and drags him through the river, and when bringing him out on the other side, Dante has forgotten his sins. There is an ensuing dance that follows, and I know that sounds weird, but the four virtuous women who I spoke of earlier, they represent the four virtues, they come and they dance with him and bring him closer to Beatrice, to which whenever Dante looks in Beatrice's eyes, he can see that the griffin on the cart is reflected as an eagle and a lion, to which whenever that happens, the three other virtuous women finish the rest of the way and get him all the way to Beatrice. This is again a show of salvation. The cardinal virtues, the ones anyone can maintain of just being good, got him to the point that he could see the reflection of the lion and the eagle, both representations of God throughout the Bible. So once he sees God, the faith, which is faith, hope, and love, can bring him the rest of the way to the side of God. So now that he's there alongside the procession, they begin to travel off to which Dante and Stadius follow. Yeah, Stadius is still there. Remember him? The guy who freaked out and grabbed Virgil's legs? Yeah, he's not sad or emotional. Let's think about him. There is a lot of symbolism that happens in these last couple cantos. Uh, so I'm going to give brief descriptions of them, although if you're interested, I encourage you to read them for yourself because it's a lot. The short version is as the convoy is moving by, there is a barren tree in the middle of this garden and everyone begins murmuring to themselves the name Adam. The griffin that is leading the chariot connects a pole from the chariot to the bear tree to which the tree immediately blossoms into a beautiful creature again. There is a belief in some old Catholic, semi-Catholic tradition that the tree that Jesus was crucified on was made of the wood from the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Or at the very least, maybe not literally, but more metaphorically so. So to that metaphor, Adam committed the first sin and destroyed the tree, to which the griffin, which we established earlier, is the representation of God, connects the pole to it, which is the cross, and it blossoms into new life. The angels begin singing a beautiful song when this happens, to which Dante falls asleep as he's now sitting in the back of a chariot, and when he wakes up, things get even weirder. When he wakes up, it is just Beatrice and the Virtues setting underneath a tree. And again, this is the very abridged version. An eagle flies down and begins attacking the tree, to which 
a vixen that is laying in the now empty chariot begins spinning around and freaking out and a serpent or dragon or scorpion thing comes up from underground and begins stinging the chariot. Now, this is the one point in Purgatorio where I feel like Dante gets into a little bit of the super symbolism, not too much plot relevant stuff, but that's okay, he's earned it at this point. The eagle represents governments, or more specifically Rome, attacking the church from above. The vixen laying in the chariot represents turmoil within the church, freaking out and spinning around. And then the serpent or dragon from underneath represents the devil, quite literally physically attacking the chariot. The chariot being a representation of the church itself. Because moments later, the chariot that is now partially destroyed is covered in feathers to try to repair itself. The idea being the state tried to destroy the church, so the church just tried to make nice with the state, and it's a pathetic excuse of what it used to be. And then the vixen and a giant, huh, giant, uh, start like making out, <laughs> I'm not kidding, in the chariot. Um, the vixen being representative of like corruption or greed in the church and the giant being representative of that greed or power within governments. And I know it's representative because as soon as the vixen looks at Dante, the giant begins violently attacking them. Um, so that being, you know, if like members of the church think they can just play nice and get in bed with the state, uh, the state will beat them to death. And throughout this entire time, Beatrice and the Virtues are quoting Psalms and the Book of John. And Beatrice says that one day this chariot will have a true heir. And this is the wildest, craziest part. Are you ready for this? There's a part where Beatrice says that in the future, one will come to slay the vixen and the giant, and they will be known by 510 and 5 or in other words, 515. To this day, no one has any clue what that means. <laughs> in the middle of this massive symbolism of the chariot being the church and them getting in bed with the state and the state trying to kill him as the eagle and Satan stabbing the church and all of that, Beatrice goes five, one, five, like it's a sleeper cell code and literally no one has any idea what Dante was talking about. The historical consensus is that this is something that literally only Dante knows about. I did search. <laughs> I did search. I did some research to try to figure out what on earth they're talking about. And one of the lead theories is that since it's a palindrome, it goes the same way forwards and backwards. This is just overall symbolism to say that it will be someone who mimics the walk of Christ. So maybe a reference to the second coming. Maybe. But that is so fantastic to me that in the Divine Comedy there is a number code and no one can figure it out. That's so cool. I will also mention that when reading that part about the entrance to Eden and Virgil leaving, I was an emotional wreck because not a lot gets to me, but sacrifice for friends as well as the love of Christ always makes me into a blubbering crybaby. And as a matter of fact, it took like six attempts for me to be able to say that to you guys without crying, and the version you got was the toughest version I could manage. So it was really nice to do all of that and then read about like Dante just tripping out of his head and like stuff stabbing chariots and feathers everywhere and there's a giant and it like beats this vixen thing and that was great, I loved it. So Dante and Stadius continue walking with Beatrice and the Seven Virtues until they get to the second river known as You Know. See the first river, the river Leith, is so that the sinner can forget their sins and continue into the garden until they get to You Know. Whereas Leith was for forgetfulness, you know is of forgiveness. And whoever drinks of it will remember their sin, but also recognize that they are now purged for it and ready for so much more. Because remember, the purpose of Eden in this story is that souls who are ascending from purgatory can be cleansed and then continue their path on to heaven, with the river of you know being the last stop. To which Dante takes a drink, remembering his past sins, but now being refreshed and renewed from them, the final lines of Purgatorio read, I returned from the most holy wave, regenerate, 
If as a new plant renewed with foliage new, pure and made apt for mounting to the stars. To which that final message about mounting to the stars refers to climbing his way through heaven, which is the final part of Divine Comedy, Paradiso. To which I will cover that final part in the future. Maybe, probably. Depends if you want me to. If you've got this far into the video, I would imagine you do, but you know, it doesn't hurt to be sure, so just let me know. <laughs> but with that, we have now covered the entirety of Dante's Purgatorio, and I just want to say thank you for watching. That was far and away to me a much better written story than Inferno, and maybe I'm just biased. Uh, I get why Inferno is cooler, because there were more layers and it was more focused about like the torture that was going on and who he was running into, but as someone who was like on board with all of that, seeing like the departure of Virgil was fantastic and like I said, that Garden of Eden, it hit me. The concept of God tilling the garden every day in case his wayward son, humanity, ever decided to come home so that the table could be set for us as people. Oh my word, you wanna talk about powerful concepts. That absolutely wrecks me. I'm still not over that. Man, anyway, okay, <laughs> that's Purgatorio. Um, I'm really excited to read Paradiso. What I'm also excited, so like when I got done with Inferno, I was like, okay, this was kinda cool or whatever. I, for one, didn't know that Purgatory is gonna be divided into tiers because I think like the tiers are the coolest part. So I just assumed hell would be like the coolest part. I, I totally didn't have faith in Dante Alighieri. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I just assumed Inferno would be the cool part and the rest would be like subpar. But I loved Purgatorio. And then I did some research forward and sure enough, heaven is divided into tiers as well. And I have no idea who's going to be there or what all that's going to entail. Uh, but I'm excited for it. Like, oh, also side note, I think I briefly mentioned this. But there's like a mirror. If you look at like hell as getting worse as it goes down and then they start at purgatory, it like flips and it's the worst ones again and it works its way to less extreme, which makes sense that the less bad or less penitent, sin or more penitent, I should say sinners, are closer to the Garden of Eden. That makes sense that, you know, if your goal is to go up, then those who have done the least bad should be the closest to the top. So it's kind of like a... Uh, pyramid on top of a pyramid for your shapes of hell and actually pyramid was a spiral so it's just like two pyramids stacked i'm absolutely out of my mind it's like one in the morning um i've been recording for four hours but yeah i love this stuff uh i love old literature i want to do paradiso kind of soon mostly because i'm just excited to read it um to know about like what's going on in hell because like hell was wild <laughs> That's a good line. Uh, hell and purgatory were wild. Uh, and I'm excited to see what Dante said heaven was like. Um, and I, did, like, I didn't expect this story to have emotional beats. Just be like, oh, these are cool. But like I said, after Eden, I'm hooked. Like, okay, tell me what you want me to know about heaven. I'm excited. Um, but yeah, this was great. I loved it. I also want to say that people were asking if I would cover other literature like this. Uh, and I never want to get into a habit... See, here's the thing, right? A comment I saw in the Dante's Inferno videos was like, oh, well, this is cool. Now people aren't going to go read it. They could just go read this, which for one thing you could say about literally any media review ever. Um, that's besides the point. But also, I don't want to make it like, here's a very modern book that just came out and I'm just going to regurgitate what the text says. Uh, this was written in the 1200s and every translation you find is like older English or at least the poetic ones are and I know most people aren't going to read them and there's so many cool ideas and concepts to run with like the concept of Eden and of dreams and of free will being both ways and things like that um, and I want to think focus on things more with that theme and I don't want to say anything specific because I've learned my lesson about promising specific video topics and then taking months to do them um however i do have ideas for content along that line so if you like this there will be more stuff like that in the future um but yeah i'm done ranting about 
Purgatorio and all that for now. I'll save it for the next one. But thank you all for sticking around that long if you have. I want to say thank you to uh, all of my patrons that you can see uh, over here. As they know, and as some of you may not know now, uh, the Patreon is now shut down. Um, I, I, I had always promised myself that if I ever got to a million subscribers, I would not take donations from people anymore because I don't, I don't need them and I'm not going to ask money from people uh, who may need that more than I do. So I shut down the Patreon. That being said, I am leaving the names of the top tier patrons in the videos for some time to come just as a thank you for giving me the platform that I have now. Uh, and it means a lot. So thank you. Thank you to all my top tier patrons who got me to this point. Thank you so much to my subscribers. We are at 1.07 million. Um, the 1 million, like that plaque just came in. Literally as I'm filming, it came in today. The 1 mil plaque came in and there's already another 70,000 subscribers. Um, you guys are so kind to me and I don't deserve it, but it means the most. Thank you so much uh, for just the continued support and everything um i'm trying to think if there's anything else uh is that no that should be good to go um oh on the second channel there's an unboxing of that as well it's not up yet but there will be shortly the unboxing of that as well as a q a uh asked me by the members of the now um forgotten or buried patreon <laughs> there's still the discord where we talk but they asked me questions before the patreon went down so there will be a q a with that at the second channel known as Wind Gang in the description trying to build that up because I have a cool project in the works you'll see whenever it happens um, but I think for now that should do it so as always I hope you enjoyed thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one bye